everyone, my name is Tiba. I'm a fourth year medical student and today I'll be explaining jaundice. So when we talk about jaundice, we first need to understand the pathway to it in which bilirubin is excreted in order to better understand how jaundice happens because jaundice occurs due to elevated levels of bilirubin in the blood. So it starts off as in the red blood cells, we know that bilirubin is a component of heme. So in the red blood cells, there is the breakdown of red blood cells by the macrophages that are part of the reticular endothelial system, whether it's the tissue macrophages or the macrophages in the spleen or the liver. When bilirubin is broken down, it is take, it is transported through albumin, it binds to albumin, transported in the blood until it enters the liver through facilitated diffusion. In the liver, it undergoes the process referred to it as conjugation, where it's conjugated with glucuronic acid. When it, once it is conjugated with glucuronic acid, it is secreted into the intestines, into the bowel. So it's actively secreted into the bile, and then it goes into the intestines. In the intestines, the bacteria, they result in the conversion of bilirubin to urobilinogen. Now, urobilinogen can go into different pathways. One, it can, it can be taken up by the liver again and then secrete it again part of the interhepatic cycle so we have the interhepatic cycle in which the bile itself goes through so it, the urobilinogen goes through it as well it can be taken up into the blood so once it is taken up into the blood it travels into the kidneys in the kidneys it is converted into urobilin and then it gives the color it's the urine its characteristic color or it can stay in the bowel and it is oxidized by the bacteria there to the brown sercobilin and that gives the stool its color. So when we talk about jaundice, jaundice can be due to three main causes. These causes can be divided into prehepatic, into intrahepatic, and into posthepatic. So the causes are usually when we talk about prehepatic and posthepatic, they're more straightforward than when we talk about intrahepatic, because when we talk about intrahepatic causes, they can be intrahepatic cholestasis of the bile. So the bile, there may, might be bile duct pr problems inside the liver itself, or it can be, for example, hepatocellular injury. For example, like hepatitis that is directly damaging the cells that is affecting its ability to conjugate the bilirubin. So let's start with the prehepatic and move on into the intrahepatic and posthepatic. And then we can discuss the different changes that happen in their lab values so we can better differentiate between them. So in general, when we talk about prehepatic causes, mostly they are due to hemolysis or ineffective erythropoiesis, for example. So let's go more into details of the prehepatic. So causes of prehepatic can be due to hemolysis, for example, ineffective erythropoiesis, uh, increased bilirubin production, or there's some medication side effects. Now mainly prehepatic jaundice, because it hasn't reached the liver yet, it results in unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So in the case of hemolysis, in G6PD deficiency, we have increased hemolysis of the red blood cells because they can't contract the increased oxidative stress due to the lack of the G6PD deficiency. In RBC structural defects, they are more prone to hemolysis, for example, due to also hemoglobin defects or hereditary spherocytosis. So they are more like spherocytes, so they are more easier to rupture. Then there's autoimmune hemolytic anemia in which they're destroyed either by IgGs or IgMs that target it. Or it can be hemolytic transfusion reaction. So after transfusion, there's more RBC lysis. It can be because the red blood cell production is ineffective. So there's a problem in there. For example, in thalassemia when it's related to hemoglobin, in pernicious anemia when it's related to B12, and sideroblastic anemia when it's related to hemoglobin synthesis. It can be due to increased bilirubin production because you gave a massive blood transfusion or there is a hematoma collection of blood and it's resorbed. Once it's resorbed, the red blood cells are broken down and that results also in increased bilirubin. It can be medication side effects like rifampin, propinacid, ribavirin, protease inhibitors. And it can also be medications that worsen already pre-existing conditions like G6PD, for example, sulfa drugs. So these are the causes of unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. It can be and it's usually an excess of hemoglobin breakdown. So there's a lot of bilirubin that is over, uh, that oversaturates the enzymes in the liver. So when it oversaturates the enzymes, they're responsible for deconjugation. It's over the capacity that the liver can take. When we talk now about interhepatic jaundice, interhepatic jaundice, it can be unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. It can be a mix of both 
or it can be conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So it's a mix of both because it can be related to bile ducts, it can be related to the liver cells. So it's kind of more, it can be related to the enzymes, so it's more broad. So when you talk about impaired bilirubin conjugation, so that what results in an unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, we have the Gilbert syndrome and the krigler najjar syndrome. In both of these, there's a problem with the UTP glucuronyl transferase that's responsible for the conjugation. So in Gilbert syndrome, it's a deficiency of it, not the complete absence. And in krigler najjar syndrome, it's complete absence of, of the enzyme. So of course, we are unable to conjugate. When we talk about the mixed, it's mostly related to hepatocellular injury. So for example, when we talk about viral hepatitis, that results in hepatocellular injury, liver diseases like alcoholic or autoimmune or cirrhosis that also cause hepatocellular injury, or drug toxicity, because we know these drugs are metabolized in the liver. So an excess of it results in excess metabolites that can cause hepatocellular injury. Conjugated hyperbilirubinemia is more related to, for example, impaired hepatic excretion of bilirubin. So these are similar that they are to the Gilbert syndrome and Najjar, that they are inherited, but they are related to the, the bilirubin is conjugated, but it is inability to excrete that bilirubin. It can be due to an intrahepatic cholestasis. So now this is related to the bile duct. For example, primary biliary cholangitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis, they are, primary biliary cholangitis affects the bile ducts, mostly intrahepatic inside the liver. Primary sclerosing affects inside the liver and outside the liver. So both of these can result in cholestasis. Maybe infiltrative, infiltrative diseases that infiltrate the liver and can result in cholestasis. It can be familial, it can be related to pregnancy, nutrition, sepsis, and also infectious diseases. Now, post-hepatic causes, uh, opposite or in contrast to prehepatic, they result more. Um, they are resulting in conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So, examples of that include what malignancies. So, malignancies like cholangiocarcinomas, pancreatic cancer. It's more mechanical obstruction from the outside. Liver cancers, gallbladder cancer, metastatic. Cancer, so they all can result in blocking of the, they can result in a biliary obstruction that's extra hepatic. Gallbladder gallstones, like colithiasis, when they, you have stones in the gallbladder, colidocolithiasis in the common bile duct, cholangitis, that happens uh, inflammation of the bile ducts. It can be inflammatory processes, like I mentioned before, the prime scores in cholangitis, pancreatitis, can be infections, for example, like liver flukes that would obstruct the biliary tract. So here is where we can differentiate between them based on the mechanism in which they occur and the differences in the AST, for example, the liver enzymes, the bilirubin, whether it's conjugated or not conjugated, based on the urinalysis and the stool color. So let's start first off with the prehepatic jaundice. In prehepatic jaundice, we have an increase in unconjugated bilirubin because it's still reset, it hasn't been, reached the liver yet. Regarding the conjugated bilirubin, it can be normal or it can be increased because we said it can, what causes the increased bilirubin is that we are, the bilirubin is over the capacity of the liver to conjugate. So the liver enzymes are saturated and they cannot conjugate more bilirubin. So you are getting more production of conjugated bilirubin, but because it exceeds the liver's capacity, now you also have unconjugated bilirubin. So the conjugate bilirubin can also be increased, but of course not increased as much as unconjugated bilirubin. Transaminases are normal. There's no hepatocellular injury. Cholestatic enzymes are normal. There is no bile duct obstruction. The urine color is normal. So when you talk about the urine color, the determines it mostly is urinary bilirubin because the urinary bilirubin is colorless. So in this case, we are having mostly an increase in unconjugated bilirubin. So that does not result in a urinary bilirubin. So that results mostly in the urinary bilirubin is going to be increased in this case. So since there is no urinary bilirubin, so the urine color is normal. Unless there is hemoglobinuria, for example, the cause is G6PD, that was a hemoglobinuria, and it's going to be dark urine. The stool color is dark because it's normal. There is still secretion. There is no obstruction. So there is still secretion of the bile and the bilirubin into the uh, intestines. In intrahepatic jaundice, the indirect bilirubin is going to be increased. The direct bilirubin can also be increased. Of course, they vary the levels depending on what's the cause of that intrahepatic jaundice. If we have entered the, the 
uh, intrahepatic or hepatocellular injury transaminases are increased. If we have intrahepatic cholestasis, also the cholestatic enzymes will be increased. Now, in this case, the urine is dark. The urine is dark because if we have the, un the what we call the, uh, the conjugate bilirubin or the dark bilirubin, it's increased, it is going to be secreted in the urine. So that will increase the urinary bilirubin. The urinary urinogen, it can be normal, right? It can be normal, so the normal amounts, or it can be increased. When is the case that the urinary urinogen is going to be increased? What's going to be happening is usually we have the secretion of the urinogen. And we have the secretion of the bilirubin into the intestines. And the intestines converted into urobilinogen. And it usually goes into that intrahepatic circulation I talked about previously. So sometimes if there is intrahepatic injury or uh, there is a hepatocellular injury, that intrahepatic circulation is affected. So that urobilinogen goes more into the blood and then it would be secreted in the urine. It would not be it would not be secreted in the intestines or it would not uh, it would not stay in the intestines because of that interruption of the interhepatic circulation. So in that case, we would see an increase in the urinary urobilinogen. Of course, because of the variability of the causes when it comes to interhepatic jaundice, it can be dark or it can be pale clay colored. Now we'll see in extrahepatic jaundice it's pale, pale, pale clay colored, because in the case that we have an extrahepatic jaundice we are going to be having no secretion because there's a blockage. So you, you don't have secretion of the bilirubin into the stool. So that's why it's mostly pale clay colored. And uh, now finally into the extrahepatic jaundice. In extrahepatic jaundice, the unconjugated is normal, right? Because it's a blockage. The liver is not affected. It can increase later on maybe if that, that extrahepatic cause is going to affect the liver in the long term, it can, but mostly we talk about it increasing the conjugated bilirubin, which is the direct bilirubin. Transaminases are normal, but cholestatic enzymes are definitely increased. It's a very dark urine. So here it was dark urine. Here we are very dark urine because we have a lot of urinary bilirubin. Because all of that direct bilirubin that's being produced here, it is going to be secreted in the urine itself. When it is secreted in the urine, it results in a very dark urine. Now, urinary urobilinogen, it's usually sometimes says absent in this case, but uh, the urine dipstick test could not completely detect the absence of urinary urobilinogen, so there is going to be uh, decreased amounts, we could say. Now, why would it be absent or decreased? When we talk about it, the urinary urobilinogen, when it, where is it produced? In the intestines. If we have no secretion due to that extra hepatic cause or extra hepatic obstruction, then I am going to be having decreased urinary urobilinogen because it's not reaching the stool, it's not being converted by the bacteria there, and then going back into the blood. And of course, because of no secretion of the bilirubin, which is eventually you know, converted into sarcobilin, I'm going to be having pale clay-colored stool. So that is the end of the video.